dark destinations. This may be end times, night creature. Why would a few more casualties trouble me? Because their blood will join yours. A radio drama anthology. You are wrong. How you figure? Every merc on Mongo is hunting you down. Not you. Your partner. He said I didn't have a ray gun. <laughs> Full cast performances set in the haunted corners of the globe. Darkness is coming for you. That's the fear that haunts me. Sleep! <laughs> ah! Dark Destinations by Father Malone at WeirdingWayMedia.com Weirding Way Media Midnight viewers, Father Malone here, and I'd like to welcome you to a special bonus series. We've been slugging it out in the horror anthology trenches for years now, and felt as though the chaff sometimes overwhelms the bloody weed in our discussions. But we've decided to throw a spotlight on some of the more superlative segments from the various and disparate series. To that end, we're heading back to Tuesday, July 17th, 1990. What are you gonna do? Whatever I can. Last time. It flew you through the back wall of the theater. At that moment, the number one film in America is Die Hard 2, produced by Joel Silver. It's one of three giant studio action films he'd produced that year, and he'd have another three the following. Joel Silver began his career as an associate producer on Walter Hill's seminal 1979 action film, The Warriors, and over the next decade, he'd amass a Colonel Tom Parker-like power over 80s cinema. 48 Hours, Weird Science, Commando, Lethal Weapon, Die Hard, Predator. If you find yourself nostalgic for the 1980s, Joel Silver had a big hand in that. And as that decade came to a close, Silver partnered up with some Hollywood heavy hitters. Richard Donner, David Geidler, Walter Hill, and Robert Zemeckis. To bring to television, or HBO, the first adaptation of the EC Comics stalwart Tales from the Crypt since the Amicus Theatrical Anthology in 1971. In addition to acting as a cinematic playground for established cinema veterans, the series would provide a forum for an entire generation of emerging filmmakers, employing the likes of Fred Decker, Frank Darabont, Terry Black, Mary Lambert, Scott Nimifro, Gregory Wyden, William Malone, and Randall Johnson. We'll get back to Mr. Johnson in a moment. The first two seasons of Tales from the Crypt were overseen by a trio of producers, Suzanne Todd, Marcus Keyes, and William Teitler. Teitler, as fans of Tales from the Dark Side will know, was old hat at anthology horror, having produced 40 episodes of Dark Side. He'd go on to produce the Jumanji films as well as Zemeckis' The Polar Express. But it was season two, Teitler's final season on the show, that gave us the episode that ran on that warm July evening. Television Terror originally appeared in Haunt of Fear number 17. It's seven pages, 40 panels, written and penciled and inked by future Mad Magazine founder Harvey Kurtzman. It's a departure from the usual heavy line and liberal color of most of the stories that appeared in the comic. Television terror is etched by Kurtzman, giving it the feel of exactly what it's attempting to evoke, black and white television. Every panel is a television camera point of view, sometimes giving us extreme angles as the camera is fumbled and dropped by the protagonist, and tells the tale of a local television journalist entering a haunted house with a psychic, Dr. Poltergeist no less. He is quickly overwhelmed with the spectral presence within and hangs himself. It's a simple tale effectively and economically told, with style to burn. <laughs> It's easy to see why a television adaptation was commissioned. As such, it was initially given a draft by writer Greg Pruss. The draft I read is dated February 1989. 
In his hands, the local news reporter became Horton Rivers, an amalgam of Geraldo Rivera and Morton Downey Jr., a reflection of the type of trash television masquerading as journalism that would eventually spawn the Jerry Springer nation we've never really recovered from. Tonight's broadcast, live from a haunted house, is run-of-the-mill for Horton Rivers, sandwiched in between exposés on Satanists and breast implants. Inside, alone, except for the cameras placed in each room, Horton is visited by the victims of the house's owner, Ada Ritter. They unfold the history of the house to him. Meanwhile, out in the TV control van, his producers and director don't see any of the spectral activity, only Horton. So when things turn malevolent and Ada Ritter appears, the crew are slow to intervene and Horton Rivers finds his fate at the end of a makeshift noose. It wouldn't film for nearly a year, and by then the script had been substantially revised by Randall Johnson. Told you we'd get back to him. Johnson would streamline the story, cutting the ghost interactions and giving us the haunted history and bursts of dialogue as narration by Horton Rivers to his cameraman Trip, who accompanies him inside. Slow burn psychological horror works great on the page, but this is television in 1990. Johnson gives us a spook show extravaganza with escalating horror that ends as the initial draft, with Horton hung for all the cameras to see. But here, it's with his own microphone wire. The episode would be directed by Charlie Pacierny, a veteran stuntman and director of dozens of episodes of television, with assists by Tales from the Dark Side veterans, director of photography Robert Draper, and editor Pasquale Buba. Man, no wonder this episode is so good. Cast as the Morton Downey Jr.-like Horton Rivers was Morton Downey Jr., and he's perfect. The episode manages a nifty balancing act of tried-and-true haunted gimmicks and actual escalating dread all the while giving us a found-footage horror film that predates that phenomena by nearly a decade. It was the combination of all of those talented individuals I mentioned, and a great many that I did not, that made the episode so damned frightful. And I got to sit down with one of them, author Randall Johnson. Midnight viewers, I'm talking to Randall Johnson about a very special episode back in the day from Tales from the Crypt. We covered that long ago, Chris Dasho and I. But we're pinpointing some of the more, well, just fantastic episodes of anthology horror. And we would be remiss if we didn't start with a, an episode about television horror. It's television terror, Tales from the Crypt. And our very special guest, Mr. Randall Johnson, wrote the episode. And uh, Randall, thank you so much for joining us here at Midnight Viewing. And uh, I want to ask you how you got involved with Tales from the Crypt, but how did you get involved with the writing process in general? Where It really starts a lot with what I call the four R's, which is Ray Bradbury, Richard Matheson, Robert Block, and of course, Rod Serling. I grew up reading those short stories, stories, the October Country, and Robert Block was immediately one of my favorite writers. I used to have these these anthologies of that Alfred Hitchcock presents and they were all horror stories and stuff like that. I loved them and they were illustrated really cool and stuff. And so I grew up with that. And then the twilight zone just to change my life. I had always written all through school when I thought I was going to be a journalist. I was actually in high school. I was uh, writing sports for my hometown newspaper, but secretly always wanting to write and illustrate uh, short stories. And then I took an introduction to the cinema course at a local community college, suddenly. And I really, the sound of screenwriter, it, it sounded to me, it sounded like a very specific type of writing. And there was, there was something about it that sounded really avant-garde. And I really, it, I, I wouldn't just be a writer. I would be a screenwriter. And given that I was very much always into illustration and images and, and things that it just felt like a match. So I applied to film schools after high school. And um, at that time, this is like 1978, there was, there were like three or four film schools in the world. That was it. It was UCLA, USC, AFI, NYU. And that was about it. I think Carnegie Mellon had a program as well, but. Oh, did it really? Okay. You do cover the East coast much more than I, so, so you would not know. But, you know, I mean, the East Coast was way too far away. I was been a, I was born in, I was born in the East Coast, but I was pretty much raised in Southern California all my life, the San Diego area. So 
So why would you go east? You wouldn't. It's so totally just fine. fool's errand, really. Yes. Yeah. Notice well, I live in Las Vegas, even though I grew up on the East Coast. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, it was writer uh, Richard Brodigan, I think, who said we we are a West Coast people. There is nothing but ocean out there, nothing but blue skies and ocean. And I, I like that. Oh, I just had an affinity always for the West Coast. Anyway, I couldn't afford most of the other schools, but my father worked for the UC system and we used to go up to basketball games at UCLA and I thought, yeah, UCLA sounds like maybe a place to try. And plus I love the legacy that it had with Coppola and you know, Colin Higgins and Paul Schrader and people like that. And of course the doors. So. Yeah. Uh, my God. Yeah, yeah. And so I got into the school. I transferred up after two years of community college and there at that school, at that time, there was a high instance of people that would go on to success. And anyway, among my fellow students there were Fred Decker, uh, Greg Wyden, Gregory Wyden, Highlander. and uh, Absolutely. A backdraft. Greg, yeah. Yeah. Greg was my roommate actually for quite a while. Oh, how that's mental. Story. That's like when both of us were like aspiring writers and taking screenwriting classes, it was kind of like spy versus spy in Mad Magazine, because when one is working and the other's like slacking up, one could hear the typewriter going in the other room and behind the, the door and this and that. Uh, it's like God, the guilt you would feel if you couldn't, <laughs> if you weren't there hammering away on your script too. So that was, it, it, it was pretty <laughs> interesting dynamic. But his like, script, can I just stop? But his script, God's Army, that got turned into a prophecy or something like that. Greg yes, Wyden. Yeah. yeah. That God's Army was a great script. And that, anyway, so, pardon me. Sorry. Oh, no, no, that's, that's quite all right. There, so there was a, it was a talented cohort that we came through with. And after film school, I got it. So I started in 1979 and got out in 82. Greg went on to grad, graduate school, I think. And I, I didn't. There was no difference between the curriculums at the time. And so I got out and I, I got a job at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences in their mailroom. And I would do As you work. do. Yeah, that is what, well, as one does, licking stamps and delivering the mail. But I could, I had access to a photocopy machine. Oh, so I could, God. and you know, when it's like you're old. old. Oh yeah. And oh, it's just like, it was great. So I would go home and then write at night. And I was like writing a, I started writing a horror script. This is my first attempt at a commercial thing outside of school. And it was about a haunted highway. It's called Slaughter Alley. And uh, about a ghost of a guy who haunts that road, stretch of road when he was killed racing on it back in 1962, whatever and stuff. Anyhow. I love this idea. That, that's it. That script. Rockabilly horror is where it's at, baby. Totally. Totally. That's it. We've already talked about the cramps on the, and stuff. It was the cramps, the gun club and all those bands that really fueled it. Pun intended. Oh, the psycho Billy beauty of it all. Yeah. Anyway, I wrote that script, gave it to a friend of mine who I'd gone through film school with, who was an aspiring producer, who he was working for a producer at the time. He got it. And it, the, the producer liked it, they were going to make it. And I learned a very valuable lesson just, uh, early on, um, I quit my job. I said, goodbye to the mail room. Oh no. Uh, I got $2,500 to rewrite the script. It was slated for production. They got Judd Nelson to play the ghost bad guy in it and Alexander Paul and everything. And two weeks before the start date, the money just went poof. And evaporated and, and I, I had to go back to the academy and get my old job back. It was really humiliating, but it was a great lesson to learn how volatile of a business this was. Anyway, Greg, all those guys had gone out and were working and I eventually I threw the movie dudes and everything else I got going. When tales from the crypt started happening, I really wanted to get in because those were my influences in terms of short anthology type horror and tales of irony, et cetera, et cetera. But Greg, I think was the first one to get uh, asked to do it. And then we, I heard about Fred and then my friend, Ethan Wiley also wrote an episode, I think, or two. And I just, I feel kind of like I got left out. But my script for Slaughter Alley had reached um, the producer of a Bill Tyler. Okay. And I yeah. remembered reading it and uh, the opportunity came up um, 
that uh, Greg uh, Pruss had written a script uh, for television terror, but he got busy with something. Greg was a, became a more of a scripter, a doctor, so to speak, and was in demand. And so they said, we have a script that's that needs rewriting. Would you take a look at it? Which, and I jumped at the chance and I read it and I said, I think I can, if it's okay with Greg, I would love to come in with it. Cause I didn't want to rewrite. I, I know what it's like to be rewritten. It's not fun, sometimes awful, but it is a necessary thing in the business that, that will happen. And I talked to Greg, we were acquaintances and he said, oh yeah, I'm so done with it. I'm please go ahead and go with it. And I said, I said, okay. So. Lovely to have the opportunity to even speak to him to get the blessing. Yeah. Well, again, we, we sort of traveled in the same circles. I mean, we were acquaintances, not close friends, but we would see each other at parties and, and we had a lot of uh, uh, friends in common. And he was at UCLA at that time as well. So, so it just seemed it. I love the fact that it's like your entire class from UCLA is basically just writing all of Tales from the Crypt for the first couple of seasons. Well, it was, I guess they all, I think it was Fred that got close to Joel Silver and under his wing, and first of all, and then Greg uh, kind of jumped in. Greg had very big success with Highlander shortly after film school. It took me a little bit longer to get things going, but, and then, oh gosh, who, yeah, Ethan Wiley. There was just a bunch of us that just got rolling and Shane Black, of course. Well, you know? naturally. Uh, yeah. So, uh, did you have any interaction with Joel Silver? I did. I have to sort of roll back on this a little bit. Roll away. Yeah. I, f I remember having a meeting with him in his office and I, I can't remember quite if it was before tales of the crypt in, in, in regard to that or afterward, but I remember it, the Joe, Joel's just like the great showman. He was like a PT Barnum of, of and I guess it sort of maybe still is, but there was a larger than life quality to Joel that was really fun. And you go into his office out there at Warner Brothers and he had like a Robbie the Robot and all sorts of monsters, all sorts of shit everywhere. And so, so it was pretty fun. But I was in his office and I remember our conversation. He had to take a call and then he goes, what? Are you kidding me? And, and then he ups the phone and he looks at me and get what? movie it was, I, I don't want to say it was something Shane Black did. And he said, uh, such and such, it's broken all box office records in Singapore. <laughs> like, wow, the like, alert the press. I mean, it was, it was just like, everything's an event with Joel Silver. <laughs> everything's an event with Joel Silver. It, it was really amazing. But I'll, I'll tell you where it really, where my, my, where he came in valuably in my situation with Tales from the Crypt was. I had met with Bill Tyler and I had met Ann Gail Lyon, who was the uh, sort of the head of development for, for it. And they had sent me the script. I came out there and we, and, or I told them roughly some things of what I wanted to do. And they said, great, we're going to set up a meeting with you, us and you and uh, Charlie Bacherny is going to direct the episode. And I said, okay, great. Sounds good. And this was really exciting to me because in, in the film business, it takes forever to get films made. And it was always, a, what was great about Tales from the Crypt is that they were just churning them out and it was just fun. It was just like a, like an old studio system type of thing. And so there was a great rush of energy about that. And everybody wanted to be on board. So I was thrilled to have this opportunity. So I go out there and we had a, we had this meeting and Charlie uh, sat in and Charlie had been, um, Joel's stunt coordinator for all, for, for God knows how long. And I think Joel was giving Charlie now the opportunity to direct this. Okay. So they sat me down and I guess they, Bill and Gail had failed to tell Charlie that I would be rewriting the script. Oh. And so Charlie comes in and he sits down and they say, well, Randall's got all these great ideas for, for the script and what he's going to do with the rewrite. And Charlie kind of looked at everyone and said, well, wait a minute. I like the script the way it is. Oh, and, yeah. and they said, well, no, Charlie, we, we really feel it needs some work. And he said, no, it doesn't. I'm directing this. I'm the director. I make these toys. And suddenly it just, it goes south at a New York minute and Charlie's up and marching around and just like saying, just 
fucking got it. I'm the fucking director. I don't tell me this. And said completely, it just blew out of control. And I'm just sitting like I'm an innocent bystander caught in the crossfire. He had already done the work in his head, right? Yes, exactly. Exactly. And I'm, I, I can understand that to a degree. It's all right. It's all right. So I'm just witnessing this and all the Bill's trying to do scramble to do some damage control and what he, and Charlie storms off down the hall and he's marching up and down the kind of cussing like crazy and everything. Bill goes and calls Joel Silver. And so, cause Joel wasn't, he was on location somewhere. I think he was on the East coast. And I remember that then, uh, Charlie was like really mad, but I encountered him in the hallway and he looks at me and he says, all right, tell me your ideas. And I said, okay. So I said, first of all, I, I my feeling about the script is that we need to make this much more visual and the Al, Al Capone's vault story debacle with Geraldo Rivera was still fresh in the zeitgeist. And I said, but I said, we really need to take this and make this like a, a probe. We're going into, you know, we're going into the alien spaceship and stuff. And we're, what the camera is going to be the point of view. We, we need to see this on live TV as it's playing out and all this and that. And he goes, yeah, I get it. I get it. And then he just starts saying, yeah, I knew you were a good writer. The moment I saw you, he was like, <laughs> and so it, he and I just started hitting it off, right? Well, Joe, uh, Bill comes back out into the hallway and said, Charlie, Joel's on the line and, and bring Randall in. And so they put me on speaker and everything. And I hear Joel just get to Charlie, like right away. Say, Charlie, Randall's a very talented writer. I don't think we had met yet. I think this is what, that's what I remember. He said, Randall's a very talented writer. We're very lucky to have him. Now you listen to me, Joel. You know, I mean, Charlie, you know, you... We're going to do this and we're going to do it that way. And, and you're going to shoot this still. All right. And then Charlie's like, yes. Okay, Joel. All right. All right. All right. Whatever. And so Joel came in and just immediately clamped down on all of the drama. Right. And we got to work and Charlie was a delight. I mean, he made that, he made that episode just really rock. It's fun. It, it is actually a very well-directed episode. Yeah. He's, yeah. He, uh, yeah, he's an interesting guy. Like. He'd been directing mainly episodic television, going back to Starsky and Hutch. Oh, uh, I didn't. Okay. okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but interesting sort of crossover because at Midnight Viewing, we're covering Tales from the Dark Side right now. Actually, a couple of crossovers here because Bill Teitler yes. basically ran Tales from the Dark Side. And uh, on your episode, the DP was Rob, Robert Draper, who was a DP on 16 episodes of Tales from the uh, Tales from the Dark Side, uh, including all of the best ones. And his work here is spectacular. He's a guy who loves film noir lighting, like deep shadows and stuff. And it is uh, deep in that. Yeah, I watched it last night and I, I had this was shot really well. It was scored well, too. I mean, there were all there were so many different things about it that I, I was re- really happy. Uh, with when I saw the final, I, I was, I went to the set, um, oh, uh, my. for, for, a, for a night I, and they were doing the stand up. I think it was the first time they were doing the stand up outside the house. That house incidentally, it was just like a half a block off of Wilshire Boulevard and in the middle of Los Angeles. Just one of, I love Los Angeles just for oh, that reason. You just, everywhere you look and turn, it's like, yeah, that was in this and that was in that. Like, oh, yeah. well, by the way, the Nightmare on Elm Street house and the Halloween house on yeah. the same street in the middle of Hollywood. It's, it's absurd. It is absurd. George Washington slept here. It's a, I mean, in it's every a- street, the names of every street have ended up as character names in every oh, script oh, ever. Yeah. Read like a Chandler a novel or something. Yeah. Okay. So, but anyway, the, so that was a long winded way of getting around to Joel Silver and all of that. But uh, yeah, that was, it, it was a great experience and, and, and on top of that. And I, and Joel, Joel just took command of everything at 3000 miles away with a phone call. And uh, he was at the height of his power then, like it really was, he truly was. And so all these guys, Fred Decker in the Pata guys, or you've probably heard about Shane Black and much, they really. They were his posse. They were, they did a lot of work together. Yeah. And that 
that a lot of you guys, are, I, I just think you're like the unsung heroes of the 1980s. Like we hear a lot about the fucking film brats, the Coppola, Scorsese, blah, 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 part, part of that. And then we jump to the 90s because the independent filmmakers felt like they had somehow created independent film. But like you guys kind of got lost in the shuffle, but there was some fantastic work getting done. You wrote Dudes, which is is a punk rock fucking Western, man, that got released in theaters. I know it didn't get released everywhere, but I certainly saw it. Oh, that's right. I re- I remember on our initial email, you mentioned that in, I, it was released in like only two theaters. I think one in New York and one, did you see it in New York? I did not see it in New York. It may have been a year later as a, uh, a special screening. Like I said, I grew up in Boston. So Cambridge had a lot of revival houses and art oh, houses. Yeah. And sure, sure. I had seen a poster for it in an actual movie theater, in a, a showcase cinema. It was the Cactus poster. Yeah, yeah. Right. Which is dreadful. But I went, oh, my God, punks in a fucking movie come into movies. I was very excited. So I sought it out when it eventually screened. So. Well, uh, at UCLA, the great thing was when I got there, Alex Cox, a director and writer of Repo Man, of course, was a teacher's aide and to, to one of the professors there. So I, I would see him around the, the, the halls a lot. And I mean, you, and there were bands within the film school. Some of the students had bands and, and things like that. So it, there was a, definitely a rock and roll punk vibe to the school at that time. And all of Los Angeles. I mean, it was just a, 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 a thing that was just taking over in, in a sense. So, but Penelope, yeah, that was great how that came about. It's like kind of a bona fide cult film now. Goddamn right as well. It should be, man. Like I watched it again last night. I liked it more than I liked it when I was a kid. Oh, funny. That's, well, I can't. I'll take that as a compliment. Then. When I was, when I was 16 or so seeing it, this is what, 88 around, I guess. I felt that, like the way Native Americans were portrayed on screen, sometimes embarrassingly so, in this case was so well handled and uh, I don't know, just a loving tribute. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for saying that. I, three ghost Native Americans on there were really cool guys, really cool guys. Arlie Bonaha was one and he was a rodeo writer and, and a bronc buster and, and. In Arizona. And uh, the other one, another one was an artist, a painter. They, they were just the coolest guys. They were so mellow and it was great. I was out on that set for, for a few, few days. I, I wanted to stay so much longer, but I couldn't. No so doubt. I, I, because I was writing the doors and I had to oh. get, and I was on a deadline, you know, on that point, but I so much wanted to stay out there for the whole thing. And Penelope was great. She just said, hey, come on out and stay as long as you want. But there, I just didn't have the time, unfortunately. But a drag. Thanks, thanks for pointing that out because that was really important to me, actually. That was an aspect of it that I wanted to bring you up. Well, because, I, because I'll, I'll tell you, and the, the, the one, one thing why it was why is that punk rock and everything that was sweeping through LA at that time, it struck me as very tribal. And the different, you had the Mohawk crowd and then you had the skinheads and you had they, they were they were all these different posses or, or tribes that were around and sometimes they would rumble and sometimes they would get together and, and, and ow ow or whatever but it just there was something really tribal about it that i thought was kind of cool and i wanted to, to capture that in some way so anyway i, well, I went to roll you, you sure did, but i'm saying about the like how well the native american iconography is well handled but also the Americana kind of iconography as well, because what I love about it is it just feels like this link between past and present as far as the sort of best, the best aspects of what we consider like a legend in America, cowboys and Indians, like the spirit of that, the old West is totally within punk rock. It's like, it's a, it seems so obvious and yet, yeah, uh, it, it took you to do it. So uh, <laughs> Yeah, but, you know, the, I, I was inspired by the bands. When the Vandals doing the Urban Struggle, I want to be a cowboy. How, what, let me just say, one of the greatest openings, of, well, the song is fucking fantastic, obviously, but the opening of Dudes, I, I will sometimes, listen, I'll sometimes just put on the opening of the movie. Just the first 10 minutes. And, okay, I, I, this is just turning into a praise fest, but... but one of my favorite opening lines in any movie ever, the, the, I, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of waiting for the world to end. 
because I was at the exact same time when I heard that line, feeling that myself as like an 18 year old, like punk kid, like oh, I was more psychobilly, but just like, where is this going? Are we actually waiting for the world to end now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, great. Thank you. Thank you very much for pointing that out and joined up. I went to the set that day too. That was like the first day of shooting in the punk rock club. And they were still in LA at that time. And I went down there and it was not a real club. It, it, they had gotten like a some sort of a practical stage set up. Um, and, there, and I got there and I saw Robert Richardson, the DP in the mosh pit, or we called it a slam pit at that point with the camera as they were rolling. And I thought, oh, this is great because we had somebody who had the nuts to get in there and really be in the heart of that. And, and uh, John Cryer and Dan Roebuck, Biscuit and, and Grant characters and Milo, they were in it too. But John Flea knew what was going on with like, but John was new to punk rock really in Roebuck too. And they were getting pushed around a lot. <laughs> but like, and apparently they got, I don't recall seeing that, but at one point they went to Penelope and said, this is like really serious. And she said, yeah, you got to man up and get, you know, you're going to get, uh, so she's always a stickler for authenticity. And it was a good, it was a good thing. It was funny. Um, I, I always feel like if, if they, if you, so when you cast John Cryer in the movie, there should have just been one additional line of dialogue that he's the suburban punk kid. He's just, he's got mom and dad to go home to. It just feels that way. He just kind of has that stage kid thing. No, no slamming against him at all. I love John oh. Cryer. But in this particular role, I sometimes think Daniel Roebuck and he should have switched roles. Yeah, that's, no, oh, that's interesting. Well, he, in his memoir, John Cryer talks about dudes very favorably, but he's the first one to admit that I was totally miscast. I didn't know what I was doing. It was a crazy, weird fucking script. And I, I felt really out of place, but I think he did the best that he could with. Oh with yeah. God. It was interesting. Penelope, who was just so gracious and allowed me in every stretch of the process. She had me, she invited me down to a casting call. So. On one particular day, we saw Tim Robbins, Kyle McLaughlin, Michael DeBar. Wow. And Kiefer Sutherland come in and read for Grant. And those all sound like pretty good choices. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And Kiefer Sutherland came in and just, for me, blew me away because he had that intensity. See, I always thought that Grant, that Biscuit would have the sort of the comedic, he would be the comedic side of it. Of it. Right. Grant really had to burn and had a chip on his shoulder and all that. And Kiefer I would just, believe Kiefer Sutherland to spin the VW around to go back and kill the motherfuckers who just killed his friend. Exactly. Exactly. He left and I looked at Penelope and I said, that's the guy. And we disagreed on that. She, I, yeah, I know he's really great, but I don't, I don't know if he has a sense of humor. And, I, and, and so that's where suddenly I, I think where Penelope started to Penelope like split a bit more in terms of the vision of it. And, right. You well, know, director's it, medium, unfortunately. Yeah. I, I, Bastards. I'm, oh, well, life's full of this. These are three a.m. in the morning kinds of things. Oh, what if this, what if that? It is what it is. It's a big It does not diminish the movie in any way. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. And I'm really, it's, I'm fat. I'm happy now, even years later, that's still finding an audience and it resonates. I'll yell it from the rafters. All right. Let's talk this script. This, this episode, ter television terror. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> now, when you received the script, you knew you were doing it. Here we go. Do they also hand you the Harvey Kurtzman comic? Yes, they did. Okay. And what did you make of that? Because I think that's a particular bit of pop art genius that that particular comic book. I didn't. I, they, what you what I sent you yes. was exactly what I got. It was a Xerox. Oh, of of that of just all those panels. What is it? Okay, is right. Right. 
Um, yeah, and effectively, yeah. It, for the listeners, effectively storyboards more than anything. Like you, uh, most people, like will just lump comics into that that you, they're interchangeable. They are not. In this case, it really is. Yes. They're drawn point of view from a like a a television camera. Correct, correct. But I just I, I was not inspired by them. I got to say, I felt that they were they were too dialogue heavy. And as I had pitched to, to Charlie, I said, we got to make this really visceral. We got to go into these dark hallways with that camera probing going ahead of us. I really wanted to make, place us there and get really immersive with this. And he, he got it. He totally said, yeah, I get that. I get that. And I think that's what he brought. So what I didn't see that in, in that comic as, as much. But th it's also a case where they didn't hand you the comic and say, adapt this. They said, here's this script, adapt it. He adapted this. This is correct. Okay. And as you probably could tell that, that Greg uh, Pruss had put in, we used a lot of his dialogue there in that opening bit. It, it's funny. The, I mean, he made the, the crack about Jim Morrison and is alive and living in Paris and, and yeah. I found that very illuminating because, of course, when I saw the when I saw the episode and saw your name, I thought, "Oh, well, he he was really he must have been in the the door. He must have been in the doors phase at this point." No, no, it was he. It was very funny. Well, I mean, it was after the doors when I right when this happened because I did my work on the doors back in 1986. Uh, which well, I wouldn't have known that. I just knew in 1990 that or 91 the movie came out, so it was around the same time in my. Yeah, of course, of course. And, and that's what one would think, but it just was happenstance. And Greg had already, that. I said, well, that works. It's pretty funny. It's a little, we're keeping that. It does uh, work. I mean, oh, no, it totally works. It totally does. Yeah. So anyway, zeroing back or circling back on the script. Yes. The thing is they, they didn't give you a whole lot of time. So it was television after all, and they had a schedule and, and it moved. So we had to pound this thing out very quickly. And I remember the experience was being, yeah, but wow. Okay. This is how I did. I did. I think I just did like one draft, maybe a, a, a little bit of polishing for the shooting draft. And that was it. It was pretty fast. Well, what's, what's that time frame? Week two? From the time of that meeting, that fateful meeting to getting out there, it was probably pre-prod within the month. I wow. Think I think it was pretty fast. Maybe it was fast. I forget where the, what's the date on this, on that shooting script. Now I won't look it up, but I used to have, Hello. I used to have all the, the shooting schedule for it and how many days and May 16th, 1990. Yeah. Boy, I was working on a project about Nikola Tesla at that time as well. And this was that it was. And I think that's when they came back to me and do to do a bill, uh, came back. God, was that first? Maybe that's what it was. I'm sorry, father, because <laughs> this is only like 35, 40 years ago, practically. And yeah, the, it, the, our listeners should know you, you technically have written two Tales from the Crypt episodes, but as listeners of my show know, that's not actually true. You have, you wrote a, a segment of a, a movie, a pilot for a show called Two Fisted Tales. And you know what? That is correct. And that I did that first now that I think about it. And I remember, and here's the reason why, because Bill Teitler remembered Slaughter Rally, my haunted highway script. And he, he rang me up and said, we're doing a spinoff of Tales from the Crypt. And it's called Two Fisted Tales, and it's going to be based on action comics. And we want to do one with hot rods and cars. And I remember, you know, Slaughter Alley. He said, can we do Slaughter Alley? And I said, well, we, Slaughter Alley had been under option. There was some, some sort of against or something. I, but I said, we can take elements of it. And I Slaughter, Slaughter Alley is supernatural, correct? It is. It is. Right. And this is, and this, so that would be more Tales from the Crypt. Anyway, and what they're asking is two-fisted tails. You can't have fucking skeletons. Right. <laughs> right. And this is what was so funny. So I did it. I remember, God, I literally, this is all coming back to me now. So thank you, Father. You have blessed me with memory. I had literally finished my draft of the Nikola Tesla script, and I had to, I remember taking it and writing the end, taking it out and putting it on the side, and then. I was writing on a manual Smith Corona typewriter at the time, 
and sliding in a new paper to write the Tales from the Crypt episode because they were calling me already. Uh, I said, what are the locations? And I was just making shit up. I said, a, a railroad yard. Yeah. And they go, yeah, that's great. That's really visual. Yeah, that's cool. And I said, how am I going to work that into this story? I don't know. An abandoned airstrip for the driver. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. So I wrote that super fast. Took a lot of elements from, inspired from Slaughter Alley and, and infused it in there. They went and shot it. And they were pleased with how that turned out. Then they said, hey, we have this other Tales from the Crypt that has not been made yet or something. And so it's a rewrite. Can you do that now? And so that's how I think that played out. Isn't that weird? That's just how it all. It, yeah. The sequence, of, the sequence of things. So sometimes you back into it. So, so what happened then is that Two Fisted Tales played on Fox television, right? I saw it. I taped it. Yes. Yeah. Frank Darabont did the, uh, his episode and then I uh, forget the third. Yellow. Episode. Yellow, which. Robert was, Zemeckis. Yes. With, with Kirk Douglas and Dan Aykroyd. There we go. Wow. So it didn't do well in the readings. This was network television suddenly now. It wasn't HBO. Yeah, it was a weird move and they didn't advertise it at all. It was one, like I said, I taped it and it was a situation where it was like, next up, two-fisted tails and I jammed a VCR tape in, a VHS tape into the VCR. Right, right, okay. So I think there was some time that went past and then all of a sudden I see that it's like, it, it's now, King of the Road is now, a, it's a Tales from the Crypt episode. I was like, what? And so what? And just cla this is classic Joel Silver thing. Hey, we could just take this and, and we could stake it. We'll, we'll put book in it with the Crypt Keeper and make it, it. It was always ambiguous about the Brad Pitt character. Where right. was, was he real or was he not? That cool. In Slaughter Alley, he was definitely a ghost. He was a rotting skeleton that was like a corpse that was behind the wheel that's smoking cigarettes and eating baby roof candy bars and just. Steffi glue and just like why couldn't they have made tales from the crypt presents slaughter alley i well i don't Come know on, it's interesting greg pruss back to television terry he's also a terrific artist and i remember fred decker was very interested in directing slaughter alley at one point and he had that was uh, like an excellent fit actually yes it was and i said that that's way cool i'm um, sure Pruss had done, I think I may still have it, a sort of a, a mock-up of a one sheet for Slaughter Alley. And it was like a road with a center divider, you know, going, converging on the, on the horizon with headlights. And then it was just this asphalt and then had Slaughter Alley, you know, in spread out to the horizon on the line. And it was pen and ink. It was really cool. I liked it a lot. I thought, oh, I was really excited that it we might go to, that was one of the opportunities. It would just never manifest. Did you turn that into your title page, I hope? I didn't. It was too big. I didn't have this. Oh, is, yeah. This well, you got to reduce it. Come before, on. Yeah. This is before scanners, man. I mean, come on. We're still trying to I'd have to Xerox it like in four different pieces. And <laughs> yeah. Each other and you want to do all that kind of stuff. That's right. Retape it. Take a photo of it. Blow that up. Shrink it. Which is very punk rock, by the way. But yeah. Uh, but, you can look at the Black Flag of Minutemen posters of that time period too. They got this, it's really the same thing, but it, yeah. So, so that, that takes me back as well. So Greg Ross was in, again, that he was in, the, in that circle. And I did all that. Okay. Back to television terror for, for a moment. For our listeners who, some of whom might be younger, will not understand the fucking insane phenomenon that was Morton Downey Jr. Oh. Around the late 1980s, he was the like Rush Limbaugh without the politics, but some of the politics, a lot of the politics, but not as pointed. He was just more of a freak show who liked to yell at people. What drove me crazy about it is he just stole his entire act from Wally George. Yeah, yeah, just <laughs> right, right. But uh, that hadn't burned in, in a while. Remember yeah. him with that hair? Good God. Who his daughter was? No, wait. I did at one, one point. Who? Uh, risky business. Rebecca de Mornay. <laughs> That's a trip, man. That looks yeah. crazy, huh? Yeah. That was, that was the rumor. This is pre social media, all sorts of stuff at that point. If it's not true, it should be. So, so Martin Downey Jr. At this point, that show's pretty much over. And now he's trying to soften his image and play on the image. And he's. 
perfect guy for this role? He was perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Turns out pretty good actor too, actually. He did a really great job, uh, but he didn't have to act a whole lot. Right. He was really good. And camera's doing all the performing here. I have to say that night I went down to the, to the set, um, and I met him and we, we were chatting quite a bit. Um, the irony of completely unaware that he had been typecast. I think, you know, we really, you know, uh, it, oh, that uh, hurts a little bit. <laughs> it was a lo- it was pretty interesting. Uh, um, yeah, he, I mean, there was no low self-esteem with, with him. I, I mean, an interesting guy. I mean, I really enjoyed our talks with him, but I, as we were chatting in between takes or whatever, I just said, wow, this, I can't believe how lucky we are to get this guy. Yeah. Let's see. I think he's really going to bring it. Like, Hey, so, let's write a parody of Morton Downey Jr. Who should we get? Morton Downey Jr. <laughs> Oh yeah, he wants to do it. He's stoked. He doesn't understand that it's a parody. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, look, I'm young as well, so maybe I was maybe he was way hip, way ahead of me. But he was lecturing me a little bit about the uh, different things and the life matters and, and and whatnot. It was very interesting and fun. I, I named the psychic on the show Doctor Workshafter. He was named after my agent. At I was wondering about that. I went and looked it up in German. It means the economist. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Doctor, you're, I mean, doctor, I'm calling you doctor because you have a PhD. In Father that. doctor. Father doctor. You know, listen, I love that you'd go to that great extent. Normally as a writer, I would contemplate very heavily about the meaning especially in German about what, what his name, his last name would be. But no, it was my agent at the time, David were chapter. And <laughs> anytime you hear a name that specific, you're like, okay, friend, or what are you trying to tell me about that character? <laughs> you are an astute viewer. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. So Morton was there with his, also with his girlfriend at the time. And I remember something that was very interesting to me that like he said every day, I teach her a new word. And, uh, okay, that's good for you. That's wow. So that one's, it was very, that was very interesting. (laughs) Says it all. Yeah. And, but it brought, it it only heightened what that, what the central conflict was uh, apart from the haunted house itself, but between him and the Sam character. Now, the Greg Prost, his version of the script, which, again, thank you for allowing me to get a look at that. Like, he kind of, his take seemed to be more intellectual in that it was what we were getting as viewers were him interacting with the ghost, not in a too menacing way at all, more like an interview almost, where the cameras aren't picking it up because they're spectral images and we don't see it. So the people in the truck are confused, but they're playing along because it's good television until it's murder, basically. Thank God you came along and rewrote the script because, first of all, like they had him in there. He had him, the script originally initially had him in there alone. There were static cameras all around the house. That's the terrible idea. We need to be handheld for this to be scary. And then he was chatting with these ghosts who should be there to fucking terrify and kill him. So good on you for uh, <laughs> sharpening that stick. <laughs> Well, that, that was the thing. I felt like it just wasn't, it wasn't scary and wasn't visceral. It wasn't cinematic. It was too much talk. And I wanted this to, I, I wanted that camera to glide around and to really just to be where it, and as we were talking about the DP, bringing in that film war, those deep, dark shadows, the, that's the kind of stuff that I wanted to make, make happen. Less talk and more about probing going into the forbidden the spectacular thing about robert draper as a dp is not only has he's got that noir um grounding but he started his career as a documentary filmmaker so like oh. four years of handheld everything so he was the perfect guy to do this just like martin down he was the perfect guy yeah it really kind of came together didn't it in, in, in all that so i, I uh, and also i was just i wanted so much to have this moment of where Hey, who's holding the camera? 
who's that behind the camera, right? Because when you're in front of a camera and the light's on you, you can't tell who's really holding that up. And I just wanted to, uh, that to be a moment that could play. But I saw it as, a, as really a, a, a series of steps. We'll start small, blah, blah, blah. We'll set it up. But then we've done a little bit of phenomena, a little mostly sound or whatever. And then we'll keep building and building until the, until the climax. I think it was Charlie's notion. I don't know. Is it, you, you've read that script more recently than I have. I don't have the flashes of the killings in, written into it. Do I know? No, I, I don't believe you do. Yeah. So those became an editorial thing. Charlie was really smart to shoot them and then interject them throughout, throughout that. Except that I, I think I did write that he saw something in the bathroom when he goes in. But, but some of the other stuff, and by the way, I think it is Charlie who's amongst the group of ghosts that block Morton's oh. escape. He's in the forefront looking with the dark hair and all, um, uh, the dark circles under his eyes, uh, there, I caught that last night and I said, I know, oh my God, that's Charlie. After all these years, I don't think I have quite recognized. There's something in your script that was not in the initial one and then doesn't appear in the final episode. And it kind of drove me crazy in that. When, when Horton goes out the window and is hung, you wrote that it's his microphone wire that hangs him. The initial one was just some rope. And then what ends up happening is a curtain rod string. And I'm just now feeling forever robbed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought it was poetic justice that he would have some sort of a microphone. And then that's the thing that he gets tangled up and like fighting off at a, or a Rita. Is it Meta? Rita? Ada. There we go. At the Ada end, Ritter, so I can see we Ritter, yes. That there would I just saw that he would get it tangled up and then just come out and just I he was literally being hanged in front of on live television. But they wanted to have the chainsaw in there. And I, I okay. Okay. Now, why would Thank she have you. a chainsaw? They added the chainsaw. Because it doesn't make any sense, and I wish it wasn't there. I, I wish I, she was holding nothing. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's how I wrote it. And he got say she comes at him or comes toward it, and he just like, oh, 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 and gets tangled up and goes out the window. Yeah, um, much more effective. The chainsaw is weird. <laughs> is it a ghost chainsaw? Is it running ghost gasoline? They, see, that's the thing. Wow. For a, for an 80 year old woman or whatever, she, she clicks, they can reveal. Really yeah. Well, one second, one second. Hold on. Uh, uh, I got to choke it. Just choke it a little. Ghost choke it. Yeah. I was watching this last night. My wife was watching that and she doesn't make a whole lot of sense. She didn't, we weren't married at that point. And I don't think she'd actually seen this whole episode. So she was kind of like, it's okay. She missed the spirit of the whole of the proceedings let's say but yeah the chainsaw was uh, i i was not happy about that i felt that was a cheat that didn't make sense whatsoever it, uh, it seems like it. it's always something that people who don't understand horror throw into horror they it, it, just like it, it's an easy thing like if you go to any horror themed park around Halloween time, you're going to encounter 700 chainsaws to so the part where you become inured to it you're just like just put that down <laughs> agree agree but again the director is in control pretty much at that point and they wanted the chainsaw i remember it being suggested and i go oh, really yeah. I don't, I don't know. but you get two actual great scares might i say the aforementioned who's holding that camera fucking horrifying and the other when trips legs slam into morton downey jr I remember gasping audibly when that happened. I, it, and I say this very rarely about horror anthology television. When the, when it's, when the question is asked, who's holding the camera, actual dread. I feel actual dread at that moment. Great. That's right. near impossible in a two hour movie. Almost like, like the statistics are pretty high for anthology television. So bravo. Oh, thank you. Well, th this just goes back to a lot of old cinematic tricks. It just is like, it, it, we have to remember that, yeah, okay, it's stuff that we see, but, you know, a lot of stuff can happen off camera. And it's what we don't see that sometimes they can have the biggest impact. And so 
And it was really just sleight of hand. Okay, kids, let's look over here. Okay, oh, there's dripping water. Oh, there's something going on. Oh, da, 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 da. Uh, meanwhile, you know, poor trips getting tripped up and taken away. We yeah, can't... but most of those setups seem, uh, were spoiled because they're mostly clumsy. Um, look over here, and then a cat jumps out. This is look over here. Oh, your worst nightmare is in fact waiting for you on the other side of the door. That's great. Yeah, good. Thanks for pointing that out. I just, I was super, super thrilled, super happy to see how that was done. And I, and I know what's coming as well, but to see it again and again, it plays really well. The other aspect of the script that I liked that uh, was not in the initial one is in the initial draft, once he's being attacked, once Horton is being attacked, even though they don't see necessarily what's going on, they're doing their damnedest to get in there. And it's a race against the clock to get Horton out before the ghosts get him. Whereas this far truer assessment of the television industry is leave him in there. Sorry, <laughs> you understand. That again was something that I felt right from the very beginning, that this had to be a story of everybody was waiting. Everybody wanted this to happen. <laughs> so that's why we had to just make him such a monumental ass that everyone would enjoy seeing him go down like this, especially on live TV. So, so again, this was at the time of the shock TV show, uh, talk shows and all that, which just became, I mean, what the, which one had the, uh, the big rumble with punk rockers on it. And there was fist fights and all sorts of crap going on the skin. They brought in the skinheads and the, and that was Gordon Downey. Yeah. I think it wasn't, you know, th that kind of sort of theater and manipulation of stuff. And I, I, oh, Geraldo, Geraldo got hit with that chair. Remember that, that skinhead melee. Yes. And it's all supposed to be in the up and that we're, we're just trying to get, we're trying to talk here and get real. Well, they got real. All right. They're not Phil Donahue. I oh. mean, no, no way, no way. But I felt like, God, this is, it's st you're still being manipulated. It's still being there. They're throwing this stuff together to see what happens. And I said, well, okay, let's throw this together and see what happens. And that's where I, I felt like also uh, the big difference between Greg's script and in mine was that the producers were and the, the crew and the booth were all men, I, I believe. And so I wanted a, him to have a female producer and somebody that he was sleeping with to bring in that kind of dynamic too. And that, and this is post me too period. Now to look back on that and how that, that was a good move. I'm glad I did it. Totally man. Prescient. They call that right. I just, I always saw her in my mind just going, having, finally having that moment, having the power to not take his shit anymore. It's just, just like. It's great because not only do we relish her revenge and the audience's revenge just on trash television, but dramatically, I noticed this again. I felt really bad at that moment for Horton. I just. <laughs> Suddenly, all alone in that house with ghosts. It, it's double terrifying. I love it. I always laugh, and it just, I mean, this, Morton was just great. He just, he owned it. He went for it. And to hear him like, get out of here. And just like, <laughs> that's like the most embarrassing shit in the world for an actor to have to do, right? And like, in, in a non actor to like step in, like, and, but he fucking kills it. Killed it. I did not have high expectations for it, but then, man, when this thing came together, I didn't see any dailies or anything. And my only exposure to the, to, to the shooting of it was just that initial night that I was there. And when I saw it all cut together, I just, I, I think, uh, I mean, I don't think it was a screening even. I think I was, I think I actually watched it on HBO when it premiered. So on July 17th, 1990, Randall Johnson, where were you watching your episode of Tales well, from I was in, Well, that's, you're probably better than I am because I think we had a small group. I think there was a small group that watched it, but I actually don't have the recollection. Can you believe that? Yes. No, I don't remember the age, kids. They were great. Um, but yeah. So where were you? 
I was in my bedroom with the lights off. And I remember very specifically, my remote control was in my hand. And when the moment of who's holding the camera came on, I went, fuck you. And threw the remote control and flipped on the lights. Awesome. Awesome. That's great. Oh, man. I love that. Oh, it makes me so happy. Yeah, I mean, it worked. Like I yeah. talked to Bob Draper. He did a Tales from the Dark Side episode called Inside the Closet by Tom Savini. Another episode that fucked me up as a kid. Like, I don't know. I'm like weirdly now talking to all these people who contributed to my twisted young mind and thanking them. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, glad to have a hand in that. <laughs> Stirring the ratatouille there or whatever. It's interesting. Is he, shoot, is he shooting still stuff? Yes, he just did. Uh, he just did three seasons of Creep Show, the Creep Show television series. Oh, he did. Oh, yeah, wow. yeah, that's great. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's great that you interviewed him. You know, yeah, the, he's he's awesome. I love that guy. I I I he, every time I watch this again and again, this I just go, this was shot really well. And I often wondered if it was just Charlie because Charlie had done a lot of second unit and really new action and stuff, or if it was DP or both or bringing that quality to it. I'm sure Mr. Draper would say it's both, but I'll say that the, the way it looks and, and some of the more effective atmosphere, well, I'm going to lay at his feet. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. I had a question for you, father. And oh, no. I, and now it has escaped me yet again, but we will perhaps return to it when, as we. <laughs> Indeed. I got it um, myself writing all this oh, shit down. <laughs> I know when I was, I, there, were, there was something I was going to say when you were talking about the influence of how scared you would get. I mean, I, for, for me, it was sometimes, I mean, I remember reading Salem's Lot and just, I was simultaneously scared out of my freaking mind and just in like, I didn't know whether to jump up and scream and love this. So I was like, this is what I want to do for my life or just hide under the bed. It was a great mix of stuff. But I remember when I met Robert Block and Robert Block wrote the psycho novel and, and he was a fantastic short story writer. And it, I just, it hit the way his stuff read and it was so satiric and so funny and there would be word twists on words and this stuff. He was, a, and he always had a great twist at the end. I met him at one point and he was very kind to me. Um, and he wrote, we, we corresponded for a while. I still have his letters. And I was asking him at one point, as I think I was just uh, coming out of film school and, and I said, how, you know, how do I get a job or something like that? And, and I, I came across this. Recently, when I had uh, moved and gone through some letters, I, I came across it and he said, well, don't write a horror film. That will forever mark you as it will limit you in terms of what the kind of work you can do. And it took me back. And to go to, to mention this, I, I bring it up because that was kind of the mindset at that time, early 80s or the late 70s. It's like, no, horror films, I mean, this is post Halloween and the, that stuff that had made a lot of money, but now it had kind of gotten into a lit, it, everybody was doing it. And it would, there was, it was kind of a, a creative ghetto a little bit to it in a sense, like no the horror genre. Yeah. 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 You don't want to there because it's low life. You want to aspire for higher stuff. And I ignored his guidance on that. And I'm glad I did because Slaughter Alley opened so many, again, it has never been made. But it opened so many doors for me to other work that led to dudes that led to dudes, then led to the doors, then this and that and whatever. So a lot of it, I guess the thing the moral of the story is scare is good. Horror is great. And it's the thing is like, he told you not to write a horror script, but like it's different for writers than directors because yeah. Everyone's first choice for George Romero is going to be a horror movie and John Carpenter. They want to make a horror movie, but you have less expectation as a writer and more people are apt to read it because if it's cool, because everyone loves horror. Right. right. Yeah. And you're right. You can get away a lot with a lot more in a horror script or a supernatural script than a visually dramatically twisted weirdness. You really have, in fact, it's encouraged. How far can you go, right? 
So it's all style. Like, and that's what you're trying to say with your first script. Look how fucking good I am. <laughs> well, right, right. Yes, I can do this. And in that sense, it got its job done. But I, I, it still it always circles back into reading, again, Ray Bradbury, Robert Block, Matheson, Richard Matheson. Oh, my God. Just the beat. And he, that's a guy who could do it all. He was a Truly. great short story writer, a novelist, a screenwriter, a television writer. He had massive success in all of those. Whereas the other guys, not so much. Bradbury was a great short story writer, arguably a novelist. Didn't do a lot of, of screenwriting. Always wanted to, but didn't do a lot of it. And they were successful of it. And the same, the same for Block, too. Underused, but Matheson was just versatile and had incredible success in every platform of media at that time. So good he made it seem effortless, which is yes. damnable of him. Because not only was he jumping from media to media or medium to medium, he, he could jump genre to genre. He could. Yeah. And here's a time traveling romance and it'll be the best time traveling romance you'll ever read. Here's a traipse through the afterlife. Oh, and here's the fucking scariest thing you're going to read. Right. And here's a Western. Yeah. And here's a Western, you son of a bitch. Yeah. And then there, then, oh my God, there's a gremlin on the wing of my airplane. And, and it's all about madness. It's all about insanity, mental health, stress. It's just like so good. It's so good. Can I tell you a quick story? Please. About Matheson? Yes. Okay. So I, I, Chris Matheson, who wrote Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, was also at UCLA at that time. And we had met a couple of times there. He was more in the theater department. The school was divided between the theater and the film side. And sometimes they mixed, sometimes they didn't. But anyway, I, it was, oh, Duel is like one of my all time favorite films. So the rumor when we were in film school always was that Duel was a very short screenplay. Now, Matheson, it was a Matheson short story. And then he wrote the screenplay for it for Spielberg to do for television. And they expanded it, released it in Europe as a feature. And I heard it was literally like, like 30 pages long or 20 pages long. You just had the dialogue and then something like, and then they duel. Right. I heard the same rumor in 1989, by the way. Truly? I did. Yeah. And believed it until I read the script. Okay. Yes. Okay. So this is before internet and all of this stuff. So we, and, and I couldn't find the script. So one day Matheson signing books at a bookstore, literally around my, around the corner from where I lived at the time in Westwood. So I went over there and waited for made my pilgrimage to the master. And I finally got, he's kind of a, he's kind of form, formidable looking. He's a little intimidating looking. Bradbury just has this big head. It's like, yeah, yeah. It's very, you know, kind of, it's, there's, there's something there. And so I introduced myself and I said, I went to film school with Chris and you know, I said, I have to ask you something. Oh no. Yes. Oh no. So I say, I'm, I'm a screenwriter. Da, 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 da. I've always heard that your script for Duel was like only 30, 20 pages long. And it, it was just, as I described, it was just the dialogue and everything. And then it was something like, and then they duel. I said, it, it is, is that true? And if it was, it was signing the book and he just stopped and he put the pen down and he looked at me and I thought I was like looking at Captain Ahab and saying, God damn you. <laughs> and there was just this pause and I just knew I, I put my book in my mouth so many times in this business and I thought, oh, here comes another one. And boy, he just looked at me and he said, every fucking moment, every line, every shot of that movie is in the script. And the, okay, thank you, Mr. Matheson, for clearing that up. I'm really glad to know that. It's just like, oh my God. It's just like, I, I told Chris that years later, Chris lives up here in Oregon now. Oh, wow. And he, uh, then he goes, yeah, yeah. Yes. Could have warned you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I just like, oh my God. Don't approach him about that. Oh, and that, that came in later on 
who would, when I worked for Spielberg in writing of The Mask of Zorro, because Spielberg was producing that and he was my person to, in terms of, he was the lead producer on it. So I had meetings with him multiple times about that story, but that's off topic. But anyway, yeah. So Matheson is like, I think this guy was just, it was a genius in terms of, well, you talk about pressing just about so many things. We're, I'm doing these bonus episodes about the best anthology television of all time, not necessarily just the series that we've covered, but definitely from Night Gallery, there's a segment called Big Surprise written by Richard Matheson. It's also based on one of his short stories that is, I think, maybe eight minutes and is as effective as anything that has ever been put on television. So yeah, I'm a massive Matheson fan. Oh, good, good. I can't recall that episode. So I got it. With I got John it. Carradine. Uh, uh, oh. Yeah, well, I love John Carradine. Okay. Check it. I don't want to, I don't want to say one word about it. Just okay. discover it for yourself. It's, oh, it's great. beautiful. And, and the title again was, was a uh, big surprise. Big surprise. Yeah. Directed by Jeno Zwark. Oh. Okay. Awesome. That's way cool. Thank you. Well, my is pleasure. It on, is it on YouTube? Night Gallery. Where do I watch Night Gallery? Well, I have oh, it on no, it's, it's not like the crypt. No, it's crypt. What the, like, where can you even find it? These. Is it off of all the episodes? Like, oh, the Tales from the Crypt? Yeah. No, you can get, I think you can see it on YouTube. I don't think anyone's taking it down because nobody's minding the ship anymore. Right, right. But yeah, I think maybe Night Gallery you might be able to find. If not, I will send it to you. I'll, we'll, uh, uh, yeah, it's great. I don't know. Do we have more to talk about television, Terry? Yes. No. Uh, yes. No. Well, maybe. I, do you have yeah. more? No, I'm trying to, I, I, again, as the writer, a, a lot of people always think. Uh, oh yeah. We were talking about like your first experience, like seeing yeah. and stuff. So yeah. yeah. I mean, they think, oh, wow, that must've been really great. You're always on the set, like hanging out and stuff like sets can get really boring, really fast for writers. And the best way that is the opening of adaptation that Charlie Kaufman wrote. And you see Nicolas Cage on the set of being John Malkovich. And basically it's like, Hey buddy, you're, can you move? You're in this, you're in this sight line. It's like, they wrote the fucking thing. It's, it's so good. So you, you stand around, you drink some coffee and shake a few hands and stuff like that. And then it's just like, no, everybody's going to work and you have nothing to do, but just sort of watch. And it's a long time in between takes. So. After a while, a lot of that luster sort of rolls off or just like, yeah, okay, I don't need to be there. I'd rather be home working, writing or watching Night Gallery and all that. But, you know, it's still sort of a thrill, but I was there, I was done and at that time. So I didn't see any of the shooting that went on on the inside of the house or any of that. I was always on the outside the whole time, but... Yeah. So, so you got to experience it as a viewer, like everybody else, like no matter how much you wrote, like once it comes to spooky time, it's kind of the director's gig at that point. Oh, yeah. Totally. In some ways I like to look at it that way. It's, I don't want to, I don't always want to see all of the stage play that goes on behind the scenes. It kind of ruins it for me. I like to look at it with fresh eyes and oftentimes it, things are there's so much time from the time that you've written something to the time that it appears on screen that you've forgotten that you're even on the set or this or that or whatever. But geez, it can be shocking sometimes too. Think, oh my God, they come, what happened here? I've had that happen too. And it's not a pleasant experience. Yeah. And, like, yeah, it just sounds like the writer ought to stay away. <laughs> I mean, well, unless it's some sort of collaborative thing where the director. Yeah, we, we've come a long way. The, the business runs itself very differently than it did then. You know, right. Talk 1980s and 1990s. And the, the vision is, I mean, the business now is, well, it's trying to figure out what it is now, in fact. But just how things were done. Writers still had a, t a stigma at that time of like, oh, he's the writer. Therefore, they're not necessarily, you're tacitly welcome on the script. Basically, hey, move aside, buddy. Let the big kids play now. Out of the pool, let the big kids play. You and don't talk to the actors. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Don't, or don't talk to them. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, don't. And that, if you really want to piss off a director, feel really uncomfortable. Or, and all directors are insecure, believe it or not, even those that is as much in command as they seem to be, they can be, they're really insecure. 
and you can go and start talking to the actor. I mean, that'll really like, I'm like what I was thinking about when I wrote your character. I particularly love actors and love talking to them. And, and because it, they're actors are givers, they're chance takers and they're storytellers. They just do it with their bodies. A lot of the, I'm, I'm big on body language and people just really inhabiting a character. So it's fun to write, kind of write things into it. But yeah, but now so the, with the, so much success of series showrunners who are writer directors again and again, and auteur directors as well, the writers have a lot more respect, I think, on the set than they used to. And in fact, that they're welcome. It used to be a cliche of like, like where you might have to might. We need you on the set because we might have to have you do some rewriting. There's a keyboard right over there. We want you to pound out some lines and rewrite this scene while we're shooting or something like that. That really happens. But I was, I will go back to dudes for a second. When I was there at the punk rock club at the first, the first day, I think Flea was stumbling over his line or something like that. He, he, there was something that was going on and I, and he kept blowing a couple of takes and I was just standing there drinking some coffee. And then Penelope just looks over and says, give me another line. And she's sort of like pointing to me, but I couldn't think of another line on the spot like that. And then five seconds passed. He said, all right, say this, blah, blah, blah. And then he did it and they're off to the races. And I, I thought, oh my God, I failed. I, I blew it. It's, a, it's an error in, in baseball. I let the, the ball go through my glove or something. Oh, I just like, fire back. That's just not how that works. <laughs> no, I'm supposed to be home with my coffee and I get to think about and try four or five different lines that see and pick the one that works best. But it's not true. You're, you're playing it up, but it's like every line means something. I have to just throw it off the top of my head. It kind of drives me crazy about improvisers. Like, I know there's a there's an art to it, and certainly there are movies that have been crafted, like Spinal Tap is genius and uh, the work of Judd Apatow. But when I hear about actors talking about improvising sometimes, I'm like, you didn't get there without that script. Put those words back in your mouth. Have a, have a take for you after. There was some journalist who uh, interviewed John Coltrane, I think at one point, and I don't think they were particularly hip to jazz and, and what it was all about. They just thought it was all improvised. So, so like, like, how do you just make up that stuff all the time? <laughs> and, you know, and he, and he said, look, you have to improvise on something off of something. So in other words, you learn a structure, you learn a thing and it's by learning that gives you then the freedom to stretch out and, and start experimenting, but you don't. It's chaos if you don't. Everyone writing free verse poetry, write me a couplet. There you go. There you go. That And look, I guess there are ears for that. Okay, that's fine. But I don't want to hear it. Midnight Viewing, the horror anthology podcast, is a proud member of Weirding Way Media. Our theme song was composed by HP with an assist from Donald Rubenstein and Erica Lindsay. If you want to hear these episodes early and commercial-free, become a patron over at patreon.com slash fathomalone. Not only are the episodes up early, but we have extended interviews and bonus podcasts where we spotlight the best episodes of horror anthologies from every series. But if you just like the show and want to help, please share it with your friends and give us a rating on your favorite podcatcher. Together we'll keep journeying through the places that are just as real, but not as brightly lit. <laughs>